Good evening, everyone. It's Friday evening, and I'm very pleased to be with you. Um, I know you're going to enjoy our guest tonight. He's He's been a friend of mine for several years now, and uh, I met him through, of course, my instructor, who you all know, Grandmaster Ken McKenzie, and they have been friends since childhood. And um, he's an amazing martial artist. He's got an amazing story, story to tell, and uh, we're going to share that with you tonight. Uh, so I want to introduce you to Grandmaster Robert J. Ott. And welcome, welcome, sir. It's good to have you with me. It's, as always, Paul, it's great to hear your voice. And it's an honor to be part of this wonderful show and relaxing and kind of catching up with things and uh, it, it feels good. It really does. Thank you for letting me have the opportunity. Absolutely. It's my pleasure, sir. And it's an honor to have you with me. Beautiful. And, um, I, you know, I want to start out. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning. Um, when martial arts started for you, I know you were very young. And, um, and, and I think for a lot of, a lot of us, we were very young when we started. And if I could get you to just talk about that a little bit, your beginnings, when you when you started and, and why? Well, I uh, was completely, I clearly remember in life knowing nothing about it, not understanding that it exists. Uh, you know, it, it, don't, there's no, I know nothing. Of, it doesn't exist. I remember that. And then I remember uh, my mother uh, introducing me to a gentleman um, that she was dating for a period of time. And uh, he took us to go see in the movie theater, a uh, martial art movie. Um, it, it was not a Bruce Lee movie, but to my understanding it was, it was a Kung Fu movie of some sort. All I do clearly, or, or all I can clearly say with confidence is, is when I walked in, I was one thing. And when I walked out of that movie theater at six years old, I was another. And it was a matter of about a month following that, that he came home and there was a package and he had me open it up and it was my first uniform. Um, as you know, uh, some in, in Japanese called a gi, and in Korean we call it a dobak. And uh, I, uh, I remember that first one is made by a company called Bear Brand, and the logo of the bear. And uh, that was my first uniform, and that's when it began at six years old. And uh, it was the confidence. It was the character. It was uh, the control and what you can do. And I think growing up with a single mother and having different struggles and uncertainty and, you know, I, I didn't have the brother, sister, the father. I, I it just was, uh, you know, that whole formula that was creating me had missing parts. And this martial arts, even at that age, was filling in those empty holes. But it's clear when someone says to me, what was it that you loved about martial arts and that, you know, was so great, you know, what is it? And my answer to when I was a young child, this first came to today, or even five years after as a young child, that another five years, another five years, the, the reasons are behind it and why it's, uh, it has become a way of life for one is not necessarily the same reasons why it started, which is, you know, I, I think that's a very common thing. The reasons why it's still a way of life for me now is totally different than the reasons why I fell in love with it in the beginning. So it's, it, it has become, uh, it went from something that I was excited with uh, and felt so great about and enjoyed, such as a great, beautiful song, you love it, it pumps you up, and it's good. The difference and the largest difference is the song's only three minutes and some seconds, give or take. This one's very interesting because it seems to be 
uh, it has become a way of life for me. It's every day, it's all the time. And it interacts with things that you're never gonna find in the martial arts manual or the dojang and or school rules. It, 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 it's every day in so many things. And so that is kind of from the beginning to, to how we're and where we're standing today, what it's kind of done to and or for me, so to speak. Right. You know, we, one of the things I like to share with my students and I share it often, um, your journey to black belt is just that. It is a journey. And when we come to that day, that joyous day, when I tie that, that coveted black belt around your waist, it's not because you learned the patterns. It's not because you learned the self-defense techniques, the strikes, the kicks. It's because you became the person that deserves to wear that belt. And it doesn't matter whether you are wearing the belt or not, you're still a black belt. We could take that belt off and you're still a black belt, aren't you? You know, Absolutely, yeah. You're, it, at your high rank, you don't have to wear your belt. You're still that person. Yeah, that, that, that is it. You're, you're 100% right. It's, it, it's, as I share, it's a way of life that stays with you through the thick and thin. And, and, you know, um, and knowing you throughout the years, Paul, um, you know, I've shared it in, uh, in my writing, I've shared, uh, in my interviews and things I've shared when standing and teaching and, 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 uh, flowing and singing the song of martial arts with all of the students. I, I've shared so many times that, um, uh, Change is something we can all count on in all so many fashions. Um, this beautiful dish of food will come and it will go. This wonderful, beautiful car you're driving will come and will go. Um, you know, there's been, the, the, you know, humans often face that in relationships. Not all. Some are with you for the thick and thin, but there's changes in them to some degree or another. Um, your profession may change. Your passion may change. Um, your, your child is not always going to have the rattle or the binky in their mouth. It, 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 it but, but I will tell you right now, um, I have grown up in apartments. I have had financial struggles. I have had lack of confidence. I have had incredible confidence. I've had very good financial stability did extremely well for myself. I had a beautiful, you know, I've had a beautiful home and homes. I have been through a lot of, you know, I, I've, I've experienced a lot of things in my journey thus far, but through all that, things have come and gone, except for, you know, one thing I can say with confidence has been with me at all times. And that is the physical, mental, possibilities of what a human can be via the art we call martial art. And it, it's always been there with me. It's never left, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's so simple to say that. And so, so comfortable saying that I was told when I was, my injury happened, I was in the hospital and I, when I first woke up, the very first things that came out of my mouth, how is my martial arts school? Who's there? Who's opening it? What's going on in my school? And um, <laughs> um, it, it, that, that's, that's how much that was. Right. You know, how much it was. I remember reading about that in your book. And it, for those of our, our uh, students that don't know, and I think most of them do, you, you, you do have a book out called Certain Victory with... Um, your life story in the book and it's very interesting and it's a it's an amazing story i i i have well thank you uh for for saying that it, it means a lot to me um it it uh i did the book 
when I arrived at a certain point in life, it was time to tell this story. I arrived at a certain point in my life and I just couldn't believe it. I just kept shaking my head, just couldn't believe how life has been for me. And um, I had to share that story. With it, I, I will, you know, be straightforward uh, right from the get-go. It was wonderful medicine for me. It was wonderful medicine. And it was very easy to write um, this book. Yes, I hired a co-author and I, I did that because I wanted it done right. My lack of experience in, in as much as I enjoyed writing, but the experience to bring it to that next level. And to, frank, to be frank and honest, you know, I'm a father with children and, and at the time my wife. And, and um, at that time, I was the president CEO of a company um, where, uh, you know, several months our highest uh, you know, I, I, I often say this, you know, our highest number you know, for quite a bit of time was 833 employees. Um, I'm sharing this because my point being is that co-author enabled me to be able to operate that business and write the book. In other words, I was juggling a lot of balls and very busy. So it really helped me. I think he did a wonderful job with that. I know when I went to the part two, the special edition, I did that on my own. My confidence was much higher with that. And I felt it was very natural. Nevertheless, though, um, that book was medicine for me. It was very, um, it was very, uh, it was, it was a really good decision I made to, to move forward and do that. It, it really helped me, you know, personally um, in so many ways. And I guess the most beautiful thing following that is that it also helped a lot of other people as well to find um, his or her vision in life once again. Um, right. A lot of people lose their vision in life uh, while their eyes still work. And uh, sometimes we need to find something that helps us get back on the tracks again. Right. So, yeah, uh, it's wonderful. Let me ask you, um, I want to get back to your beginning. At, at that time, you know, who, who, who were some of your heroes, people that influenced you in the martial arts? And because and, um, I know I had my heroes. I know Grandmaster McKenzie had yours. I know you had to have somebody that stood out that really inspired you. I, I, I you know, there, there's definitely... Uh... Uh, certainly more than one person uh, that I can share and discuss with that. Um, really, um, there is certainly more than one person. Um, and and I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I often enough when teaching and my students know that, you know, the ingredients to my meal um, and, uh, often enough, anybody who had the opportunity, uh, to visit my school, I had, uh, had, I had shut down about seven years ago because of some personal changes in life. Um, he or she would know if you looked above the mirrors, there's all these plaques, there wouldn't plaques, but the plaques had pictures on each, uh, whether it be myself with the individual or be a cover magazine. And it was these different martial artists who, who just meant the world to me. Um, and I admired so much. However, I think that was the outer part uh, of the shell. When, when the truth came to it, some of the most special people in martial arts are, are uh, some of them have names that are without question, um, well-known and, and uh, and some are not as well known. I, I you know, I, I mean, I'll make it simple right from the beginning. Grandmaster Kenneth P. McKenzie, um, my brother, uh, he is a very uh, special person in my life who I miss dearly. And it's been a struggle not having have talked to him in quite a while. Um, and I know, well, I can tell you, right, I've already heard, you know, his voice is really getting uh, better and better every day. Uh, I don't think you recognize that much when you're walking in those shoes, but 
Uh, it has been, and I've noticed that. And believe me, if anybody's good at hearing, I'm an expert at it. And uh, he's just done so many unique little things uh, that have helped me uh, go the right direction. I know when I first met him, I was a martial artist. I was a black belt. I was young, but I certainly was not grounded. And uh, life these days can push and pull you in a lot of directions. Um, and he is one of the most special people to help me go in a good direction. I, I, I have a, a young lady who is one of the students of Grandmaster McKenzie's school. And this little young girl, honestly, uh, I, her age, I've got some pictures of her and I together, me teaching her and her and I staying with each other. And uh, I can't really remember. Maybe she was eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. And uh, she was one of the students, intermediate rank. And uh, this little girl, um, um, I, I think in one of the pictures, I have her name and my name. But um, she was a student, a regular student. But she was visually impaired. She was legally blind. She was just a regular human being, legally blind. And one of the students at Ken McKenzie's school. And that little young lady is one of my most special martial artists. Whether she has stayed with it or not, her time and what she got during her time will never leave her. It'll be with her forever. And me spending time with that young lady and seeing what a strong, beautiful, fantastic flowering warrior she is has been a wonderful thing for myself. Um, in life. And, um, you know, I learned a long time ago, a true teacher is a true student. And as much as I have that natural ability to teach and that passion, I learn every day. So some of the best people um, going down that list um, are names and things that people would not necessarily think about that I would be saying necessarily, or con you know, consider that, but you'd be amazed at a uh, families who are doing martial arts together, um, people who, uh, you know, you, you, you come across and you may never see them again, but it was just that moment of time that difference is made. I uh, have a bond, you know, with a handful of people in martial arts, you know, from Grandmaster McKenzie to Chief Master John Godwin, um, my fellow martial artists, Grandmaster, Chief Master George Heath out of Pennsylvania, who I knew when I operated and managed the chain of martial arts schools in Pennsylvania under Grandmaster Goche Tuck. And of course, Grandmaster Goche Tuck himself, so much I've learned from him, my confidence, my ability to open up a school. And, and I, I began to realize that I'm a, a teacher and I'm natural at it because of working with him these are just so special, you know, the martial arts. There are martial arts that are so special that I never met, that I've read about, that have done something for me in my life. And uh, then there are ones I've only met one time that don't realize, you know, who and what they were, how they affected me. My first instructor, Richard M. Cameron, a man who has many layers to himself and different directions, um, I talk about him in my special edition of the book and, and uh, you know, but I, you know, the big picture is not the layers and different things people know about him. That doesn't matter to me. I simply know about him and I didn't get caught up in this, that, or different things during my study on him. I simply studied under him and I followed and I observed how he handled life in different ways and what his journey has been through. And when he lived in Korea and just all those different things, it, you know, it will never be forgotten. And he was also somebody who really pushed me hard to put my uniform back on after I became blind. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, him and Grandmaster McKenzie, you know, Grandmaster Go and many others made such a difference that have helped me, you know, in life to be okay with myself. And uh, it, it, it does that when you have a life and you get 
shaken up through a traumatic thing, um, no matter who you are, you need to uh, be okay with uh, putting your arms around somebody else and learning and listening. And, you know, it's, it's really important. So, you know, I, I uh, to me, that is, is one of the most special things in the martial arts and the people that I respect the most. Grandmaster In Sun Sale, the chairman of the World Hamanja Kapkido Association, you know, Grandmaster In Hyuk founder of Kuk Sulwan, Dojunim Jihanje. Dojunim Jihanje and I, what an amazing relationship and bond. You know, if anybody read the article uh, the first time I was on the cover of Take One of the Times, um, articles called The Eyes of Kido Kwan. And Grandmaster Dojin M. Jihan Jay and I talked about the third eye in so many variations and levels. And uh, he, he's done, he, just that alone is 10 times more powerful than any technique I've ever learned with him. His techniques, I'm still sore and I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. So <laughs> I, I know mean, what you're talking about. Yeah, we don't even have to get into too much of that, but it was just amazing the wonderful special people. So I hope that's helped to answer that question because it really is, it, it's, a, it's a simple question, but when you have it as a way of life, the people you met and you really are deep, it, it, it's, it's a question that you have to answer in, 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 in different ways. So Paul, I, 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 I'll tell you what, uh, all those people have helped me. Um, they've been the ingredients to my meal and. Uh, you know, and that matters to me. If anybody notices in this special edition of my book, when I wrote the second part, a very large part of it was my appreciation to the people who have helped me write that right. book. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's the level that is. The copy that I have actually has both books together. Yes. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So. Um, uh, we've gotten to the point where I, in, in our talk, I would, I would really like to get into how you lost your sight. And uh, it, it's an amazing story of perseverance and indomitable spirit and um, a certain victory attitude. And I don't think you could have picked a better name for the book. Um, so if you could get into that, and uh, explain that, you know, some of our people know a little bit about it, but they really don't know the details and what happened, how it happened, and um, how you were able to overcome that huge adversity that had been dealt you wrongly. I, uh, I'm going to... Uh... I think have a few parts to answer in that question because I want to do it, you know, responding to what you just said, each of your words. I want to be really clear about some things. I want to first start off with long before uh, my injury happened. The first Taekwondo Times magazine I picked up had Chuck Norris on the cover. The top of his dobok was white. The bottom pants were black, which I never really liked that much, but that's just me. Um, and uh, he was on the cover. And, uh, you know, for those of you who know or don't know, um, being born and raised in the Delaware Valley, Southern New Jersey, Northern Delaware, and the surrounding areas of Philadelphia. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we're people who uh, are familiar with the move closer to the world, my friend, Action News. And that type of environment, uh, the Korean art, uh, the way of the China hand, or should I say in, in, in Korean, uh, Tung Su Do via Subak Do, uh, which was founded and created um, by Huang Ki, 
um, Huang Qi retired and passed away um, in southern New Jersey, a town called Morristown. And his school was in Springfield, if I recall. All through the Delaware Valley and out to where you are located in Pittsburgh, Paul, Tung Su Du uh, was uh, common and in many, many places and very strong in that whole area. There was more Tung Su Du schools than you would see a name of Taekwondo in the, in the earlier years. And J. Chol Shin was one of the first people to come to the area. And J. Chol Shin uh, was all from that area, the president of the World Tung Su Do Association. And J. Chol Shin, Grandmaster, um, who I have pictured him and I together quite a bit, known each other well, so highly respected. I remember seeing him at tournaments all my life growing up. You know, he was one of the higher level people under the founder, Huang Qi. And his last school he had in the Delaware Valley was, of course, uh, right there in South Philadelphia. In any case, I share that because J. Chol Shin uh, was the original instructor for Chuck Norris. So I pick up the magazine. I don't know Chuck Norris, yet I know his history and story. And I know here I am in the Delaware Valley and his history and story talks starts, you know, with his first instructor, Jay Chol Shin Tung Sudo. So that little, that little bit of that has me open that magazine. And that was the first time I ever picked it up. I was an intermediate level student, maybe even beginner level, yellow, green belt, gup grade. And, uh, in reading that magazine from the front page to the back page, um, there was an article, and I don't remember the title of the article necessarily, but the article goes out, I'm going to say Iowa, but it may have been another state um, in the middle of our beautiful, the Midwest of our country. Uh, there's a man who loves his martial arts and uh, he uh, just tested for his black belt under a Korean master. And one day he got into his little personal plane, a small little personal plane he had. And uh, whatever happened while he was flying, Settings. Two hours ago. Software on table. The auto he ended up hitting, he ended up hitting high high tension wires, high tension lines. And um, he crashed to the ground, he was alive, and 85 to 90% of his body was burnt. And the story continued, this man, his, his grandmaster instructor went out to the hospital, and the story continued of, of days into weeks, weeks into months, and I, I now can look back and understand that so well. At the time of reading it, I was not as clear on that. And it shows picture of him going through rehab, physical therapy, trying to just lift his leg up with the skin being burnt. And the story comes to an end um, with he now is back with his uniform on, doing his martial arts, and has recovered since that horrific um accident that happened and at the very last part of this article it says this is a true story of pil sung which translates certain victory through strength courage and indomitable spirit following myself reading that article i clearly thought that i now know what pil sung is and that became a philosophy uh, something I shared and taught and, and passed on to others through all my years uh, since knowing it and studying martial arts. And, and it was a way of life for me, Pilsum. I understood it, so I thought. And the years went by and life moved on. And uh, 
I was a young man. My first study of Korean martial arts was Tae Soo Do Chung Du Kwan. Tae Soo Do was a common word used before Taekwondo became the word they voted on. Um, Tung Soo Do was a word and Tae Soo Do was a word. There was many different words. They were all from Kwans. There were nine Kwans. Uh, my first Kwan was Chung Du Kwan, which in English translates to Blue Wave School. I earned my black belt first Dan Ildan in Tae Du Chung Du Kwan. And of course, with that parallel to that, earned my first Dan uh, Kuki Wan under in English, the World Taekwondo Federation, uh, which was who overseen uh, Taekwondo, uh, their Olympic sport in South Korea. And uh, lived and breathed it, competed in tournaments, studied, traveled, met some of the most special people, and uh, it was a way of life for me. Meeting Grandmaster McKenzie and uh, uh, earning my rank and uh, traveling an hour and a half to southeastern Pennsylvania and uh, meeting Grandmaster Go and realizing this is who I need to study from. And within no time, a year, year and a half, become the office manager, chief instructor of the school having responsibility for a young man. Back then it was the Yellow Pages. Every month we had $10,000 bill from the Donnelly Directory and a $15,000 bill from the Yellow Pages bell. And for all the counties that our advertising was in, we had an agreement with Mellon Bank where when everybody would sign up, um, the bank would send us the entire amount of the value of that membership while uh, the student would simply make monthly payments. And we had an incredible system. I learned how to operate that business so well. I left there and opened my own school in New Jersey and uh, was affiliated with some of the best people. And it was all my passion. And uh, it was certain victory. It was Bill Sun. And uh, that's how things were. That's what things became. It helped me with education. It helped me with my relationship, the love of my life. It helped me my self confidence uh, in, in in you know in being able to walk up and how I present myself and shake another man's hand or a woman's hand and how I would interact and how you would handle each person in a different manner. And uh, it's just incredible um, all the things that it did for me and. Uh, it, it, it's just uh, you can never you can never say enough words about that the appreciation of all the things it can do for you. I remember uh, I was at a point in my school. It was the fall, and the brown and orange and yellow leaves are coming down. And I love the fall. I always have. And uh, it was the early fall. The kids were back in school. Um, I was in a relationship and uh, her and I were kind of a little bit back and forth. We were young and uh, she had gone back to school. You know, we still were in touch. We had gotten together the weekend prior and uh, all was good. And uh, I had just gotten done uh, training by myself in my school, my dojang, because we were getting ready in about two weeks to head to Michigan, where the headquarters of the North American Hapkido Association was located and where the tournament uh, that is hosted and the tests were going to be located. I was going to be testing for a new rank and competing in the tournament. So I was practicing uh, uh, getting ready for that. There was so much on my mind that I remember. Uh, I don't remember ending the practice. What I remember is I was standing in the dojang by myself the lights were out in the school and the only lights that were on were the lights above the showcase windows that looked out over the main road. And I was staring out over the road with the leaves coming down. And I was staring and the sweat was dripping down me. And I was staring and just, I was, I was thinking, I was questioning, I was wondering things. This beautiful school for a young man. Everything I achieved, now people believe in me. And these little children who are looking up to me and parents come to me for guidance, but yet, I was struggling. I just gave my mother away at her wedding and uh, my mother gave birth uh, to 
my little brother and you know we have a 20 year difference in age and uh just so many things and i uh was running through my mind and financially I had a beautiful car uh, expensive uh monthly payments and my uh, school um you know doing the business and actually operating it. everybody thinks they can open up a business and have a school everybody thinks they've got it all figured out until they have the school open and operating that business there's so much to it it was looking beautiful on the outside but on the inside there was a lot of uncertainty and questions that i was dealing with i did not want to go to my mother my mother has a man she has met that she's in love with i want her to enjoy her time in life she's raised me on her own and uh i i just was keeping a lot inside and didn't want to let anybody down and i remember that evening uh i changed washed up i remember leaving the dojang i bowed to the flags and i said to myself i'm gonna make it i'm gonna make this happen and one way or another i got in the car it was a really beautiful song that came on i left i ended up picking up a good friend and we uh, stopped and got some pizza on the way home. I took a nice shower and changed my clothes. And we sat there on beautiful fall, the weather out in the front patio. It's about four feet off the ground, the railing around it. We sat out there relaxed and just kind of caught up with life and chit-chatting. And uh, different conversations. Some people stopped by. We said hello. This had a little chit-chat here and there. People passed by, see we're there. And, come and sit down with us and chit chat a little bit then they leave and it was time for me to take him home my friend i had class starting saturday morning early and i uh, remember uh this female who i was in love with at the time believe it or not if you went through my backyard and hopped over the fence you were in her yard and she was the street she was 10th avenue i was 9th avenue and uh to, i was in the car and to turn right so to speak, was the way to go to take my friend home. But uh, I wanted to turn left so I could pass by the house to see if she was home. I mean, we were together the weekend before, but, uh, you know, it was just that, uh, you know, she mattered and uh, my care and everything. So I hung that left-hand turn, hung the next left. Her car wasn't there said to my friend greg you know what let's go have a cocktail and uh that was something i did have no plans or intention to do all day in any manner but doing that as a young man um was very similar to being able to put a patch on a hole or a band-aid on a wound before the wound was healed properly. It was a temporary way of injecting uh, something that makes you not think about everything going on, all the questions in your financial relationship, whatever it may be. And that evening we arrived and uh, uh, I was there uh, at a lounge for no more than 12 minutes, give or take. Um, when a large group of people came in, obviously somebody was getting married as a bachelor party. And this group of people, all of them were heavily intoxicated and already prior to coming there. I, at the time, uh, was talking to a female who worked there and we were talking and having a nice conversation. And one of the gentlemen came up and uh, he uh, almost like he wanted to just walk right in front of me to go to her and to, you know, uh, do whatever he could to get her attention and, and uh, let him know he's interested in her and everything else, verbal things and everything. She at that time got closer to me and, you know, to let him know that she's with me. Um, that seemed to go on a little bit back and forth. She finally uh, walked towards the back. I, at the time, my friend who I came with was towards the rear end of the bar. So I uh, put my leather jacket back on and I started walking uh, towards the back there. And as I walked 
you know, the man was there when I turned to walk and I said to him, I said, my friend, you've had a little bit too much to drink. And um, I turned and started walking. Uh, within seconds following that, I was pushed from behind. And then, uh, you know, the story I'm sharing at that point became uh, a uh, almost like a motion, a, a grayish, a, a you know, just the air and everything just start flowing in my memory. Uh, I know I turned around and no sooner I turned around when there was a set of hands behind me saying, you know, let's take this outside, Robert. You're going to take this guy out. This guy, you know, the, the person knew me and the person was saying verbal things that I'm going to be able to beat this guy up in every manner and kick his rear end and everything else. And I, you know, I'm like, my hands are up in the air. And I just was like, uh, 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 okay, you know, that was all happening. So everything verbal that was being said was only feeding the fire with the other individual. I was in really good shape. I wasn't concerned about me being able to defend myself. The concern I had, I grew up in the Delaware Valley and I've been in areas uh, where there's good stability, financial stability, great people, family, warmth, everything. I've been to areas in South Jersey where um, you don't want to stay in one place too long and uh, it is dangerous and you really are risking your life. Very dangerous areas. And uh, I, you know, I've learned a lot about people and how people, you know, are and who they are. A lot of times I don't think people realize, you know, that 85% of communication is nonverbal. And for a blind man to remind those who can see of that, well, I don't know. In any case, I was able to see that this man had something on me. Now, when I say it's something on me, it's important you hear the rest of the story. What he had on me in this particular situation, he had on him something that concerned me as I'm being pushed into the fight with this person. What he had is I could tell by looking at this man that he didn't care if he was gonna be alive in the next hour. He had no care about life of what tomorrow is going to be for him and his future. I share it to anybody. Those individuals are without question dangerous. And often enough, our country is attacked by people who grow up and learn with a certain religion or a belief or a culture that has their minds being that way. And that is why it is so challenging, you know, these days dealing with terrorists and things along those lines. Um, it, it, is, it is a true battle because much of them are okay with losing his or her own life. So I knew this was in some way or another very similar to what I am going to be put in. You know, we're going to be pushed through one door into a four that's maybe eight foot by 10 foot and then out the second door into the parking lot. So while I'm being pushed out there, this gentleman is pushing me out the door, is sitting there, letting me know how I'm going to be able to kick this guy's rear end. My mind's also thinking that this guy really doesn't care much about life. This is what I'm going to be dealing with. Needless to say, that didn't matter either because I'm now in the foyer and I had to make some decisions quick. I decided I want to use this foyer. When you're a martial artist, you understand what I'm saying. You understand, you know, you've got the way of the mind, the way of the body the way of the key energy inside, and you also have the way of the extensions of your body. I wanted to use that foyer as the extensions of my body. I wanted the fight to happen there. Why? Because it was extension of my body. I was going to be able to use the walls, the floor, the doors, and the location as a friend to assist me in this fight. And that's where I broke loose. And that is where the fight began with me and this individual. Um, as you know, a lot of people know, I ended with a head injury. And when someone has a head injury, often enough, it's those last couple minutes that you don't remember 100% of. Well, I don't remember 100% of 
but I clearly remember certain things and those certain things I recall a hundred percent of those certain things. I remember having him up against the wall. I remember um, my hands moving at a very high speed uh, towards his body. Uh, I believe you call that punching him. Um, and I remember my knee being used quite a bit. And I remember my right leg going between his legs. And it went between his legs and went behind his left leg up a little bit more, a little bit lower to the knee, but up a little bit more. And that is when I took my right hand and I did a palm strike to his upper chest while I pulled his leg the opposite way. We often call that a major inner leg sweep. Some call it a reap or a sweep. And I brought him down to the ground, dropped my knee on him, and uh, the fists continue. Somehow the next thing I remember is I'm standing up now, that individual is out the door and done and gone. And the person I came to the bar with from my house was standing in front of me. He was also one of my martial arts students and he had the jacket on from my school. I um, was tucking my shirt in at the time you know, running my hair and getting my head together and taking that breath or two or three or 10. Okay, that just happened. It's over and done with. Okay. And while that was happening, the front door to my left cracked open. And as I'm looking eye to eye to my friend in front of me, tucking my shirt in, the door cracked open. Uh, the individual he had gone out to his car, very upset about how things went. And, uh, you know, he, uh, <laughs> I guess in his life, you know, it's unacceptable for, uh, you know, a fight to happen. And, and uh, I guess if you don't win and beat somebody up, that's unacceptable because it was unacceptable, whatever I did to him. I'm not quite clear what I did to him because I said I had a head injury. I mean, you have that, you can't remember the specifics. But I'm taking a good guess, whatever I did to him, he was not happy about. He came back, cracked open the door, put a gun to my head, and pulled the trigger. So the bullet entered the left part of my skull, and it was on an angle following entering the skull. On an angle, it went through the left temporal lobe of my brain. It damaged, it did not cut in half, but it damaged the optic nerves to my left eye. It then continued to travel. It destroyed my ability to taste and smell and then exited cutting my eye in half, my right eye socket, which ended up having to be removed. And that's today is now a prosthetic eye. That is what, happened October 6, 1990. There, there's a lot of things to get into, and that's why I wrote the book. But I share the story in a simple way. Uh, the trauma center happened to be within just a couple miles of where the injury happened, which was just fate of that being that way. The one of the ambulance drivers who came, picked up my body, happened to be an uncle of a female that I had a relationship for many years, small world. And uh, I went to the trauma center. I spent just under 18 hours in the trauma center. The neurosurgeons were clear in their mind there was nothing they could do. I'm going to die. There's many stories of the people who came and visited in those two days. Um, there was easily over 200 people two days in a row at different times um, that were there and um, from all over the Delaware Valley. And uh, it was a change of a shift for the nurses who were in the trauma center. A lot of nurses in trauma center via how they're paid 
and what they're dealing with. A lot of them only do two or three days a week. Um, there's so much behind it, the hours you work, etc. A new nurse came in and her name is Fran Orth. And in my book, in my story, uh, friends, without Fran, I wouldn't be alive. She came in, saw, looked at my clipboard, looked at me, looked at my clipboard, looked at me, looked at my clipboard, looked at me. She went to the neurosurgeon. She says, how come you don't have his head lifted up? How come this, how come that, how come that? And the response she got was, there's nothing we can do. He's going to die. On her own, this nurse, getting paid one way or another, did something that was not in the rules, was not part of her job description. She went back to a back phone, found the number, and called the one neurosurgeon who was not there, who's part of the same group. This neurosurgeon was part of that group, but he had a different personality than a lot of them did. This neurosurgeon, his name is uh, Luis Cervantes, originally from Portugal. Luis Cervantes was well known to put his hands into a surgery that other doctors didn't want to touch, when other doctors were more concerned about liability than anything else. She called him, called my mother. My mother didn't know what to do, what direction to go. He talked to her, he says, I can't guarantee anything, but I'm willing to try to save your son's life. And so he did, he saved my life. And uh, it was about a month later, I ended up with meningitis. It took about a week to find out what type of meningitis it was. And uh, surgery number two happened. And, and that was where they uh, had to pull my face down, uh, open up my skull, reposition my brain which was pushed out of its normal place and following that open up my lower left part of my stomach take out an amount of tissue and patch it to the area where the bullet went through the left temporal lobe then of course pull my face back up and staple across my forehead and that was surgery too. Following that was many levels of psychological interactions, challenges, uh, handling, uh, just so many things in the steps it went through at that time. There was a couple of plastic surgeries for my left eye to get it to shut all the way. Um, because of the damage with the nerves, the eyeball kind of looked up a little bit, but uh, it was a process, you know, and, and it, it really, I'll be honest with you, it was about a month after this happened before I began to realize and understand that I was blind. Um, when you have a head injury like that, you are hallucinating, you are seeing things, your mind is everywhere. I was uh, in a bed in the middle of an ocean. I was in a bed in the middle of a furniture store. Um, the furniture store was closed. It was at night, but I was in the bed there. Um, the only way for me, and yet I would not go to the bathroom in a bedpan. I had to go to the bathroom. Tubes attached to me and everything. And finally, uh, my mother realized, you know, she told her husband, go get a carpet and bring a carpet in there. And she did put a carpet in the room. And when I touched the carpet, I realized I'm no longer in an ocean or in a furniture store. And I was able then to go to the bathroom. It was, uh, it was a, an incredible journey. I remember uh, a female doctor was really pushing hard to get me to go to rehab next door. And I said, no, I want to go home. I will rehabilitate with my people, my family at home. And she would start to ask me these questions and see how I would answer those questions. And if I'd screw up, you know, it's more on her side than reasons why I need to go to that place. But it, it didn't work. I answered the questions and I did not go to that place. I went home and uh, and it just became it began to, you know, that's when the journey began. That was the journey began when it began. And uh, it was during the months to follow that turned into the year. And at different moments in time when. 
that word came back again, pill some, certain victory through strength, courage, and a down spirit. And when that article I read of the man getting burnt, it, it all came to light. I began to get the big, big picture of what strength, courage, a down spirit, and certain victory is. And at that point, as much as I thought I knew what it was in the past, I now know what it is and what it's about. And it's no gift of happiness and glee. It, it's not a, it's not like once you know it, that you're okay now. It, it, it is, um, it is recognition in your heart and soul that you have the ability to fight this. It's not recognition in your soul that it's going to do it for you. And uh, so anyway, that's why I named my book Certain Victory, because <laughs> it was just, uh, it was all of that and then some. Sure. And I think for um, anyone who's read the book, like myself, I've read it a couple of times, and um, it's very evident to the reader as to why you named it Certain Victory, especially if we're, if for martial artists like us who understand what certain victory is. And of course, I, have, I haven't gotten near the understanding of, of certain victory as you do. Um, I mean, I, I live my life daily with that way of life in my heart. Um, but I have never had to, I've faced adversity, but never the adversity that you have how however i will say this um your story is very inspirational to people like me that can say you know what if he can get through that i can get through the fact that i can't pay my electric bill this month it seems very trivial then and uh, i still have my health and i have my family and i'm able to get along in life just fine it'll be okay and a lot of that is because when I look at a person such as yourself and I see what you've gone through and what you've been able to overcome what I have going on is is it's trivial compared to what you've been able to accomplish well I, I will tell you Paul uh, I use certain victory every day um, I use it every day. Uh, it's, uh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to have that tool. Um, I use it every day and it's, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I have a townhouse I live in here and, uh, I'm single and I'm raising two kids and, uh, I am in the food service feeding the government and we're dealing with this Corona and, uh, money comes and money goes. And, uh, there's just so many things. I'm using it every day. It is, uh, it's the most special thing um, that, you know, martial arts has allowed me to find and obtain and, and, and have in my life. I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful about that. And like I said, it's not giving you something. It's allowing and reminding you that you, you can, you can move forward. You can keep going. And I think that's a really important thing, no doubt about it. So, um, you know. You, you were how old when this happened? I was uh, 21 years old. Right. And um, it, it, it's been about 30 years. Yeah, this October will be, thir this October will be 30 years. And, uh, you know, this, this October will be 30 years. So, and, and you've been involved in the martial arts since you were about six? That is correct, my friend. Right. And um, so you have been living that way of life, the uh, Musado, the way of the warrior, since you were six years old. You've taught um, hundreds of students. And what I, what I want to talk about here, uh, briefly is our young people are going through a lot right now and they they do in everyday life 
uh, but right now, I think some of our, our young people um, around the 10 year old range, the young teens, maybe even younger than that, um, are scared. You know, they have uh, this pandemic is, has been, um, it's turned their lives upside down. And I think it, what I would really like you to talk about from all of your experience as a martial artist, how important do you think it is for our young people to be involved with martial arts and what that would mean to them? Well, it, it, you know, I, I, I am certainly um, not knocking on doors, uh, letting you know about the Bible and how my church is welcoming you. Um, I am certainly not trying to convince you that, uh, you know, Little Caesars or Domino's Pizza or Pizza or whatever, you know, I'm not trying to advertise some product here. Don't need to do any of that. Um, I just will say that I shared with you one thing, just one thing. And that was a pretty big one thing I shared you that martial arts has done for me. That's just one thing. And I don't think anyone who really knows how to listen and, and, and is listening and watching you and I right now, um, sitting down by our fireplace and talking about life, Paul, is not picking up on what it had, you know, what it takes and what it had taken uh, to turn that page in life. So with that being the case, um, it is one of the best things you can uh, get your hands on and become a part of uh, that you'll ever come to notice, see, or come across during your years on this planet. You're going to see a lot of things and ways and journeys people go on and things and ideas. And this is one of the most incredible things. Um, it really is. And uh, it is um, a way of life and it is not ever going to step into what you eat, how you teach your kids. Uh, you're, it's not going to change what days you have to think differently than others or uh, what you need to read and pray. And it's not going to get into any of that. It is going to allow you to be you. And, and it's there and it's there for you. So the, the realism um, of, you know, how great it is, is something that all of us who experience it and know it want to share to others. And I will tell you, we do our best in everything, and some will see this and be sold on us and give this a chance in their life. I will tell you, I have not met one person who has allowed this and opened their arms to be part of this and give it a shot in life, who has not ended up doing the same exact thing, sharing to somebody else later how fantastic it is and what it's doing for he or she. It is, um, it is not failed um, every year uh, for its election for those voters. And um, it is not ran out of money. Um, it seems to handle this corona quite well. Uh, it's okay if you're financially stable, if you're not. It thinks you look good, even when you look like crap. 
it is something that doesn't get much better. And if I could inject that into a tablet or a drink or, you know, a hit to the body that gets you to understand, see what I'm saying, then you know and are clear on everything it can do for you when having it be part of your journey in life and experiencing it. I will tell you right now, um, there are waves with it. There are changes with it. There are, there's a part of it when it's very physical and very visual. And, um, and on the outside, every part of it needs to show and see it that way. And then there are parts of it where it's not even being seen right away. It's not even being realized that it's there. Um, and, and that has been, all that has been just so clear for myself. Um, for it, it, when it's a way of life for you, it, it's always with you. And like right now, uh, I'm not teaching full time. I'm not, the uniform's not on me every day. Um, my focus is on this and that. And it's no different for me than it was when I was doing it seven days a week. Right. It's no different right now. It's just another phase and another part of it. Um, because there's only 24 hours a day and the body needs to sleep. And you only have so much time on our time on this planet. And I don't think I ever would have been able to even get a taste of what I've come to realize martial arts can give to one if life didn't have these changes for me where I needed to focus on other things to be a father raising these kids and, and sacrifice, you know, going to the gym every day. I, I don't think I would have uh, uh, ever come to see what martial arts can give if I didn't happen to go through that. So those challenges and those hills to climb and, and, and the fears and the uncertainty and the, the highs and the lows, they do nothing but feed martial arts to be even more. It's an incredible thing. It's yes. an incredible thing. And, I, and no it's, it's safe to say that it's very important for these young kids, such as, um, you know, some of our students, I know uh, one of Grandmaster McKenzie's junior black belts, Mr. Leo, um, he he actually he always asks good questions and that was one of the things he wanted us to talk about was and i think it's safe for us to say i mean we have talked about it through the entire <coughs> interview um it's very important for guys his age <coughs> and and girls i don't mean to exclude the, the young ladies but kids in general i think the martial arts offers an education in personal development and a way of life that they're not going to get anywhere else that's going to help them tremendously when life knocks you down it's going to help you get back up that certain victory attitude that that doesn't come from anywhere else uh, i i cannot imagine being a human and living the life for the length of time it's meant to be on this planet that has no value, that has no appreciation or respect or, 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 or uh, energy inside or hope willingness or lust i cannot imagine uh having a mind with all the doors shut and not laughing and uh seeing the needs and feeling the fears and loving the love i cannot even imagine a human being not having that integrity, that, that perseverance, um, it's, uh, it's, it, I can't imagine that. And yet 
I'm saying that to you because a lot of those things we are losing in how our society has, you know, has continued to travel. A lot of it has changed. We, 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 our patients, we don't know if we have good patients or not because we get things like this. We don't have to go to get because we hit a couple buttons and it comes to our front door. Um, we uh, are addicted, and I'm telling you, we're going to overdose one day on immediate gratification. Right. Work ethics are out the doors. Communication is. Uh, I think I think they took it out of the English dictionary. Um. I interview people and a lot of the young people, they're sitting across from me in a booth and I'm interviewing these people for a job. They're, they're in their mid twenties or teens, whatever it may be. And, and they, they don't, they don't know how to talk to me at all. Right. They, they're, they're trying to figure out how to talk to me and they have a hard time looking at me. <laughs> I can tell. When someone, when I'm talking to somebody straightforward, I can tell if they're looking to me. You can hear their voices moving. You can hear that they're sure. looking this way when they're talking to you. Sure. I don't care if my eyes work. Look at me when I'm talking to you know, look at me when you're talking to me. They, they, they can't do that, but they can be 10 feet away and they can text you whatever. Uh, no problem. There's nothing wrong with the tools and all these great things, but we are losing all those values uh, 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 that allow us uh, uh, to properly live that life and and, uh, and work together and, and grow and strengthen and form a foundation. We're losing a lot of that in how things are, are coming to be these days. Um, and so with martial arts, I can't, you know, I can't say in enough ways. Um, you'll be caught while you're falling in the air before you hit that ground by the martial arts. It'll catch you. And slowly but surely, it'll bring you back and put you in that saddle and you'll be okay. It is a, it is a great friend and it's always there for you. And uh, so the youth, um, I cannot share it enough how much of a great asset would be for a child to have the opportunity of coming and studying at a fantastic dojang under a fantastic great instructor. For example, a person like yourself, Paul, it would make such a great difference for that young lady or that young man in his or her life. No doubt about it. There's a lot of good instructors out there and uh, there's a lot of good dojangs and there's several, you know, that men like ourselves who are teaching Musa Do, right? the way of the warrior. And um, that's another subject we could talk about for a long time, the way of the warrior and what that actually means. But my my students have a good idea what that means. That's fantastic. And, uh, a, um, I want to wind up with uh, one last question, and um, I, I'm going to be honest. I you know Grandmaster McKenzie supports me in in this endeavor uh, quite a bit, and uh, he's been a, a great supporter all along, but with this new endeavor of our interviewing of um, the stars in martial arts, the big, the big boys, you know, the guys who've really made a difference and ladies, we haven't got a, a lady interviewed yet, but um, he has been a major supporter and, you know, he helps me uh, come up with some of the questions. He gives me some advice and, um, uh, you know, he, uh, I'll be honest with you, I, this next one, <laughs> he helped me with. And, um, and, 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 you know, we know how much you love to teach. 
and uh, you've been a, you know, I have uh, learned from you. I've been in the dojang with you and, and spent some time with you as our teacher. And uh, I know how much you love it. And uh, I know that um, you're aware of the International Hapkido Summit that uh, Grandmaster McKenzie hosts every year. And last year he actually hosted it, he co-hosted it with Grandmaster John Godwin, who I, I know you know him quite well. Um, and uh, you know where I'm going with this. I, we really would like you to come and uh, instruct <laughs> at that event. And um, actually, I, I, I honestly, I don't think we're going to take no for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 uh, oh my. I, I'm I, not putting you on the spot. Well, I guess I am, but you don't have to, uh, no, it's, it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I thank you so much. What's the date? When is it scheduled? I believe it's October 2nd. Uh, let me check my calendar here real quick. I'm pretty sure it's the first uh, weekend in October. Well, I will say this to you. Yes, sir. Uh, I will say this to you right now. In this beautiful opportunity, I've got to talk this podcast interview. I've shared a few things. And one of the things I talked about was uh, how things in life come and go. And... Uh, Many, many, many things come and go. Um, and I also share with you how martial arts doesn't. It stays with you. So people like Grandmaster McKenzie, who would talk with his pinky like this, who knew the name of my turtle, in my bedroom, when I lived in Runnymede in the apartment complex, my turtle Frank, and that somehow got lost in my room. We never found him. And uh, he uh, was the one who is in my book, is in my film documentary. He knows him and I can be on the other side of a room, you know, with a thousand people, don't matter. And his eyes can lock into mine, vice versa. And we just had a conversation. Uh, you know, we covered a whole topic without even talking. And that relationship I have with him is one of the things that's helped me getting by right now with the fact that him and I have not had the ability to talk because of the issue with the voice being challenged. I know him and I are talking every day all the time so I go back many things will come and go will change but martial arts will not and with that being the case this event in October and me having the ability uh, to make that happen um, I would be honored and I will certainly make note of it and uh I don't want to let anybody down. So my resume and my history is uh, very good. And uh, we'll see what happens. I think, uh, you know, I think it would be a great, wonderful thing. And the time would be, would be good as well to visit my family. So I will certainly make this note and put it down there for that beautiful event. That'd be fantastic. I mean, you, your, uh, your teaching. I mean, as I said, I've, I've learned from you. I've been, well, I learned from you every time we taught, but I've been on the, on the mats with you. And, uh, I know you're an amazing instructor and, um, I know the attendees of that event will benefit greatly from you being there. Well, I thank you, Paul. I thank you very much for that. Um, it's been, uh, I've been using martial arts 
in so many ways the last seven years going through uh, a change in my 16 year marriage, going through a change in my position uh, with the program, the business enterprise program and, and, um, and my children, my kids, um, and, and uh, who I love more than anything else. They, they're just, they're incredible. And uh, they test me, they bring me to the top, they drop me on the ground. And if it wasn't for martial arts and everything, um, I'm not so sure. Uh, well, I certainly know that most of everything we had to talk about and what I've done in my life and overcoming would not have happened if the martial arts didn't exist. I, um, I've shared this story. One of the most beautiful things, uh, my son and my daughter, I'm, I'm very close and I love them. I don't think, I think at their age and what they're going through change in life or anything, I don't think, well, it's, I, I just think it takes time and, and everything to really get that whole thing, but they're so special. Um, I've got so many little things I could talk about my son and my daughter, but I will never forget one evening, my daughter wanted to sleep with me and, uh, which happened quite a bit in the younger, younger years. And, uh, we, uh, it was time for us now to shut our eyes and go to sleep. And I was almost asleep. And at this point in my life, I was getting ready for a speaking engagement with the wounded warriors. I was going to be speaking to the wounded warriors, sharing my story and, uh, from victim to survivor. And uh, I was having a time, you know, where I was struggling. And I was struggling because I was trying to get my flow down in my mind. I want to give these wounded warriors, I want to give them, I want to give them that flowering warrior. I, I want, you know, I want them to have the nine virtues and the, you know, the five, you know, tenets, um, philosophies and theories of how we approach life and I, I want them to have that to carry that and I, I really want to I don't want I want to I don't want to I want to do it right but I was struggling and I'm almost asleep and my daughter goes daddy I said yes my love as I turned around to face her what's going on she says I'm so glad you're blind well I needless to say I couldn't help but to raise that right eyebrow a little bit and do some mouth movements with my mouth wondering, okay, Robert, never a dull moment in your life. I wonder what this one's about. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, okay, if you don't mind me asking, why is that my love? She says to me, this little, little child says to me, she says, daddy, If you didn't go blind, you would have never become a licensed blind vendor in the business enterprise program, graduated, moved to the Northwest, met mommy, and I wouldn't be here to be with you if you didn't go blind. And I just... <laughs> Yeah, I thought I just had a boxing match with Mike Tyson in his younger years. Um, it's, it's amazing how kids think, isn't it? Oh, my Lord. And that young lady, um, I miss her. And uh, she's at that age right now where I don't know how much she listens to me or wants to listen to me. And uh, I love her so much. And... Uh, we can get into these little arguments sometimes that I don't want, I don't ever want, I try to avoid it in any way, but I want her to get anything she can from me to take with her during my time while I'm still here on this planet. Um, she's, she's a good lady and a uh, young lady and, and uh, she uh, has helped me many times more than once. I had interviewed uh, not long ago for a contract that I worked very hard for, for a long time. And I, I have everything to show everybody who knows what happened knows and is sitting there still scratching her head, but I didn't get it. And at the time she was in Montana with her brother and uh, my in-laws camping. And she texted me back the most special words that really helped me you know, be okay with what happened. 
And uh, so that bond you have in the martial arts inside and Ken McKenzie and all of how the journey has gone so far um, is a real winner in my book. People like you, Paul, help me remember this sometimes. And so I really thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and share some things on your, you know, on your podcast here. And, and I wish you nothing but the best with everything you're doing. And uh, it means a lot. And, uh, you know, uh, you've got my strength, courage, and Donald's spirit behind you. If there's ever anything I can do uh, to continue uh, supporting and helping what you're doing grow, please let me know. Yes, sir. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you coming on. Um, if you would, as I uh, sign off on the broadcast, if you wouldn't mind, just stay on for a moment. Uh, when I get uh, when we get off the live broadcast, I would like to just uh, talk to you for a moment and do a proper goodbye. Sounds fantastic. You bet. It's been a pleasure. And I say to all out there tonight um, who are there watching and listening um, to your show this evening that um, uh, we are going to get through these challenging times uh, without question. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainties and be okay with uncertainties because there would not be certainties if we didn't have uncertainties. So it's okay to sometimes not be sure what's going to be next. It's all part of the cohesion of things in life that keep us together. The yes, the no, the um, the yang. And that's the way that is. It's part of life. We're going to get through this. We are. And all of you um, are what uh, helps me every day be who I am, whatever my path is to be during my time on this planet. All of you make that. I can never thank you enough. Thank you, sir. Uh, so everybody, we've been speaking with uh, Grandmaster Robert J. Ott, uh, an amazing individual with an amazing story. I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. And um, sir, we'll probably, uh, I, I would love to have you back on again in the future and uh, share some more of your wisdom with everyone. Absolutely. It's been and nothing so, but a pleasure, Paul. Thank, thank you, you so much. sir. And uh, we are going to sign off, everybody. I look forward to seeing you all in class on Monday.